battle between angels and demons. If you ask me, I'm face to face with Satan. We're this close. Not within the realms of heaven and hell, but within one woman's mind, body, and soul. I almost thought in my mind that, oh my god, maybe it's a possession. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle by the power of God. Send you to hell, Satan, and all evil spirits who wander this world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Arnold, Maryland, just outside of Annapolis, is home to Kathy Sheets. In the fall of 2010, Kathy and her son Michael are at a crossroads, preparing to start a new chapter in their lives. My son and I have a very special bond. Um, we have been through so much together. I'm stopping. I have been raising Michael pretty much on my own since Michael was a baby. A typical life of any single mother where you're juggling 50 different things at a time, but you try and spend as much time with your child as you can. After years of living alone with her son, Kathy has invited her boyfriend, Brian Davis, to come live with them. For professional reasons, Brian consented to be interviewed only under the condition of anonymity. When I met Kathy, it was pretty much love at first sight. It was uh, just that feeling of, you know, you just met somebody you've been looking for for a long time. <laughs> Get all this stuff in. Just stand there, Michael. Grab a box. Hey, buddy. Please. Brian is about to finalize his divorce and is nervous about starting a new relationship. Sure about this? I'm sure. Well, welcome home, honey. Thanks. <laughs> I'm here. You know, 43 years, I'm here. I have met my soulmate. This is the man I'm going to grow old with. Ryan lived in, Mom was absolutely thrilled. My townhouse was my safe zone. My home is a home that everybody comes to. <laughs> everybody eats there. Everyone, when you have a problem, they land at Kathy's house. To help Michael get comfortable with the new living arrangements, time, right? Brian moves into a spare bedroom in the basement. At first glance, everything seems normal. As I'm unpacking my stuff moving in, I could literally hear something walking behind me. It's, uh, you could hear footsteps in sequence. I could take my head and follow the sound around me. You know, I'll just pass it off as the house the ventilation system kicked on or floors acclimating, you know, whatever it was, I didn't pay much attention to it. Brian doesn't mention this strange occurrence to Kathy. What he doesn't know is that this is only the beginning of a terrifying series of supernatural events that will change their lives forever. And Michael will be targeted as well. While Brian spends one last night in his old house, Michael works in his room. He thinks the only other living being in the house is his mother.
I was in my room, I was awake on my laptop, and so I felt like someone just crawled up my back like a spider. Mom. What's wrong, Michael? Were you in my room a few minutes ago? No. No, go to bed. Children at that age, you don't know what they're thinking. If it's a bug, kill it. You know, if I have to get up to kill a bug, you know, I'm gonna be upset. It's three o'clock in the morning. I took it as Michael just finding an excuse to stay up late. <sighs> Go, Michael, I have work tomorrow and you have school. Seriously, go to bed. Brush it off. You're a man. Deal with it. Say Hail Mary and you'll be fine. Go to bed. <laughs> All right. Even though my mom will tell me that nothing was there and to go to sleep, don't worry about it, I always had the fear in the back of my mind that something was there watching me. Whatever touched Michael in his room is now ready for Kathy. I woke up in the middle of the night to my entire bed shaking. It almost felt like an earthquake. I looked outside first, and then I looked around the room to see if something had fallen, and I didn't see anything. I was able to write this off as I have no idea what it was, but it's not a big deal. Kathy wonders if her fears may be based on her new commitment to Brian. So she decides to consult Bonnie Morris, a family friend who is a psychic. Are you? you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. What I'd like you to do is take a moment and think about what you'd really like to know, what you'd really like to ask. Is this thing going to work? I don't always tell people what they want to hear. I tell them what I'm actually seeing. A lot of times people don't want something to work because they're vulnerable. Bonnie uses tarot cards, ancient tools of the occult, to influence her advice. Some cards represent fallen angels who become demons. What may appear a random sequence convinces Bonnie their fears are justified. If you can overcome your fears, you can have a very bright future together. I did tell her that the relationship had a good potential, but there was no guarantee. In the following weeks, Kathy's fears about the future begin to fade. I could see the bond between Michael and Brian developing. And it was a nice feeling to finally have a father for Michael on a daily basis. But just when Kathy begins to feel her life is coming together, a drastic change occurs in the same room where Brian heard mysterious footsteps a month earlier. I had gone into the basement and I went to turn on the light and it wouldn't go on. Standing before Kathy is a figure that will become her worst nightmare. Kathy Sheets is experiencing her first encounter with the face of evil. That is the most intense, incredible fear of your entire existence in that moment. Horrific is a light word. I need to talk to you. Yeah. This is serious. What happened? I saw something in the basement. I think it was a man. I mean, he was there, then he was gone. I don't know what I saw, but I know I saw something. Slow down. And I could tell, you know, in her eyes that she was very scared and, and didn't know what was going on. 
I wanted to believe her. At first, I had said that, well, maybe you're just tired. Uh, was it a dream? Uh, me being skeptical, of course, trying to find a logical reason for it. And she told me flat out, no, I saw something with my own eyes. I was wide awake. You believe me? Yeah. Yeah, of course I do. It's just, you know, whatever it was is gone now, right? Maybe yeah. you're just tired, okay? And then he, of course, calm down. <laughs> calm down. It's okay, Kathy. It's okay. You know what? You need to take it easy for a while. I guess you're right. We'll find out what it is. Brian knows this is similar to what he experienced, but for now, he keeps that to himself. Kathy has no idea that the dark force that she encountered may soon be battling for her soul with a very different entity. I noticed that at the corner of my eye, something very fast and white, and there he was this enormous, white, beautiful angel. I had never seen a wingspan that large before. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I thought I was dead. It lasted about five seconds, very clear. I didn't know who it was, but I knew that this was something pretty amazing. I thought, if I'm not dead, I'm dying, because you're not supposed to see these things unless it's upon your death. Kathy is desperate for some kind of explanation, so she immediately goes to her friend Bonnie, hoping that the psychic can help her understand what she saw. I see an angel, I see demons. What's going on? This, this thing was right in front of me. As close as we are right now, but I know it sounds crazy, but it's true, I, I just don't know what I saw. It, okay, that, okay, let's take a moment, take a deep breath. I believe that what you saw is your spirit guide. You mean an angel? Mm -hmm. If you'd want to call it that. Why would I see something like that? If it was your spirit guide, it's trying to help you. Okay. Or, or warn you. I gotta go to work, no, buddy. No, no, if I start thinking like this, I'll go crazy. I think if I just don't pay any attention to it, it'll, it'll go away. I'm just gonna keep praying, I'm gonna go to work, I'm just gonna live my life and just pay no mind to this at all, and it'll go away. Kathy tries to forget her visions, instead focusing on her future with Brian. In June 2011, Brian's divorce is finalized. He and Kathy immediately decide to get married. Honey, are you ready? I am. Wow, you look beautiful. Thank you. I am. Let's do this. I felt by making the relationship into a formal marriage would relax everybody's mind. In his mind, from his past marriage, in my mind of being a single mother for a long time, in Michael having a stepfather finally that he could turn to for everything. For me, it, it was, it, it felt good. It was gonna work. After the wedding, Kathy works hard to maintain a romantic atmosphere. While Michael is away at a friend's house, she prepares for a night alone with Brian. now I made us dinner no Michael's at a friend's house tonight it's just the two of us we better hurry up then <laughs> see you soon in 
all of a sudden, my hand went numb. I looked down, and they were blue. Normal thinking is you're having a stroke, but it's both hands. A stroke is normally one side of the brain or the other. I didn't know what it was. And I got on the phone, and I called 911, and I said, something is wrong, I'm turning blue. Then the back of my head went numb. I, I need an ambulance. I can't feel my hands. I think I'm going to pass out. For Kathy, what she thought was only psychological is now becoming physical. Kathy, she's... <laughs> <laughs> and the stakes will be high for herself, her family, and her sanity. When Kathy Sheets is rushed to the hospital, she is found to have blood pressure of 200 over 100. Normal is 120 over 80. Mr. Davis, ma'am. We can't exactly say what brought the attack on, but she's stable for now, okay? You can take her home in the morning, but the most important thing to remember is that she's gonna need to get plenty of rest over the next few days. Okay. All right. Thanks, doctor. You're welcome. The doctors hadn't come to a conclusion as to why her blood pressure would jump up like that. Uh, but what the doctors did say is that under normal circumstances, somebody would have gone into a cardiac arrest or had a stroke. The doctor at the hospital at that time told me it was a panic attack. There was nothing wrong with me. They called it situational stress, meaning that somebody can be under so much pressure and so much stress that it will elevate the blood pressure to the point of almost a stroke and or combustion. And once you alleviate that stress, it will then go away. In the morning, Kathy returns home relieved that she doesn't have a life-threatening medical condition. Mom. Hi, sweetheart. Come here. Are you OK? Mm, I'm fine. I just need to take things a little slower from now on. Think you can help me with that? She said, honey, something's going on with, with me, and I can't be the same mom I used to be anymore. I have to worry about myself now. I said, OK. I was kind of sad that mom wouldn't be the same anymore for, like, ever. I, I kind of got used to it. One morning while Michael is at school, Kathy speaks to an old friend. She is desperate for support. Oh, the doctor said it was stress, but that doesn't explain everything. No, oh, Brian doesn't know what to do either. Nobody does. I feel like I'm completely alone. I need help. I, I can't do this alone. Oh, great. Boy, I thought my life was bad before. This is as bad as it gets. Why didn't I just see that? So you don't know what to do. I was really scared. Soon after the latest attack, Kathy goes to pick up her son from school. She is exhausted and hopes the worst is over. It's not. And I'm sitting in that car. Something's pressing on your head and you can't see it. And you can't speak. And it takes your head and it twists it in a very unnatural position. Like it's gonna take your neck and snap it. Your head twists that way. And you feel something right here and you can't get your words out. It is the most screwed up feeling I've ever had in my life. Something is trying to kill you. I started to say the Our Father, 
and I couldn't get the Our Father out. I was walking out of school, from summer school, and she was in a weird position. <laughs> Mom? <laughs> Mom? It looked very unnatural, very unnatural. To the point where I was like, it was, I knew it was forced upon her. I said, hold mommy's hand. What is that prayer that mommy taught you? He goes, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Say it again, say it again, say it again. <gasps> Jesus, God in heaven, what just happened to me? I was worried about what's going on with her, and she wouldn't tell me. Michael, something's trying to hurt me, baby. I can't see it. Right there. No. To Kathy's horror, she learns that her son has been experiencing supernatural events as well. I was in my bed. I, I was just listening to music. And the pull, pull it to my back, back, or pull it all the way back. You see it stretching. It literally flew across the room. And it landed on the floor right next to you. When Michael finally came forth with some of the things that had happened to him, I was upset. I felt like I was a bad mother. I'm so sorry. I let something get near my son. He couldn't come to me. It's okay, Mom. I did not defend my son. That's not a good feeling. I don't know, Kathy. Maybe this thing is in your head. All in my head? Nice. It's happening to Michael, too. You can't keep ignoring this. I am not ignoring it. But I can't believe something just because you want me to. We don't have to try so hard not to believe it. My son's safety is at stake here. He's scared, OK? I believe that. But that does not mean there are ghosts in the house. Kathy's personality turned 180, 180 degrees. She was very desperate to have anyone and everyone believe her uh, because she was scared. Whatever was going on, you're there for your spouse, for better, for worse, richer and poorer, sickness and in health. That was not happening. And I felt it. Oh, Kathy, I am so tired of hearing about this all the time. I don't know what is going on, and I can't do anything about it. I just want everything to go back to normal. So do I. I just don't have that option. I felt like I had completely lost uh, the, the woman that I married. Um, and it, it was very, uh, very confusing for me. That same night, the family is so troubled by their experiences, they sleep in the same room. And Michael becomes the demon's target. Kathy realizes that Michael is repeating the argument she had with Brian. How could this child who was not even home know what I said to Brian before I went to work? He wasn't even there. Brian realizes things are far from normal, but he cannot comprehend how his family could become cursed. Honestly, the reason I had thought that that situation occurred to where Michael sat up and spoke. I almost thought in my mind that, oh my God, maybe it's a uh, possession. For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. In the spring of 2011, Kathy Sheets witnesses supernatural behavior in her 15-year-old son, Michael. 
She seeks help from her husband. Michael? The next morning, I told Brian I did not tell my son. I was afraid to tell my son. Oh, hey, by the way, something spoke through you. You don't tell your son that. He repeated our entire conversation from yesterday. Every word, verbatim. How could he do that? He wasn't even home yesterday when we were talking. So I started to research. What do you do when you got a demon in your home? Google. Kathy finds and invites Hiram Henderson to the house, a former naval intelligence officer who performs paranormal investigations. What appealed to me about Hiram is he's smart. I don't know anything about technology. I don't know anything about paranormal. I don't know anything about any of this. He does. After seeing his credentials and, you know, seeing the stuff that he showed us, we felt reassured that, you know, this wasn't a uh, kind of a fly-by-night thing. He was, he was the real deal. I needed to have an explanation for what was going on. And I felt that he would be the guy that could provide that for me. Hiram sets up devices to capture EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, using a spirit box set to record random radio frequencies. The general den of questions tried to flesh out what entities might, inf might actually be there that could confirm our experience. Why are you here? What do you want? Are you of God? I think you're afraid of me. You're not welcome in this home. You have to leave. At Hiram's office, Kathy and Brian hear the sounds of their demons. Why are you here? I'm not into hearing this stuff. I don't want to hear it. I see it, that's enough. What do you want? Although the message is incomprehensible, the very fact that the demon is communicating with the earthly realm is terrifying. Oh boy, there's something in my home. There's not just one. There are many. I think you're afraid of me. Oh God. The content of what Hiram found on those EVPs was horrific. All these horrific things that confirmed, 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 confirmed exactly what I had seen and heard. You're not welcome in this home. You have to leave. <laughs> I am so sorry I didn't believe you. Thank you. I understand that sometimes there are some things that you think you might hear and you don't, but what I heard uh, was real. Wow. Finally, he understands. It was a relief. OK, help me fight. Thank God. Thank you. And we're not done yet. If you guys want to get rid of this thing, you're going to have to do it yourselves. Hiram said to me in a conversation that this is the mother of all portals. He has never heard or has been in contact with anything this great. Every second, every inch, every minute of every tape is covered with multiple entities. It is a mystery to Hiram why Kathy's home might be such a passageway. He offers no solutions. He's a scientist, not a soothsayer. Paranormal investigators consider portals to be doorways through which spirits pass between earthly and unearthly dimensions. It is a mystery to Hiram why Kathy's home might be the location for such a passageway. After learning the horrifying news that their house is a portal, Kathy and her family try to get a good night's sleep. Wait, wait, 
A late night fire alarm sends Kathy Sheets and her family into panic. But they quickly realize it was a false alarm. I went and checked the battery in it. The battery's fine. It's an electric one with a battery backup. Went off for no reason. Oh my God. It's okay, sweetie. It's just a false alarm. But deep down, Kathy knows this is yet another sign of a demonic presence. She decides it's time to seek help beyond psychics and paranormal investigators. Kathy needs to fight pure evil with pure good. I knew I needed help. I needed something higher than me. Thank you for seeing me, Father. What can I do for you? I'm seeing things in my house. I've seen a white apparition, and I've seen a dark apparition. And I'm really, really afraid for my family, Father. There are angels and demons all around us. They're always with us, but God is with us too. And anytime you need help, all you have to do is ask him. Remember, he is bigger than any evil in this world. After hearing Kathy's story, the priest concludes he has no choice but to encounter the demon himself face to face. For Kathy Sheets, months of nightmarish experiences convince her and her family to call in a priest. When the priest arrived at our house, you know, this was like our salvation. We couldn't get him in the house fast enough. You know, we felt like this was what we needed. This was the answer. Um, this would take care of all of our problems. He could feel some bad energy in the house, especially down in the basement where our bedroom was. That was the strongest energy down there. In a matter of seconds, Father John knows something is here, something very dark, something that wants Kathy gone. O oh, Heavenly Father, Almighty God. The priest sensed a, a negativity. He sensed a thickness. He sensed a, an anger, something. I don't know what you call it. He sensed it. You could feel it. He was scared. His hands were shaking. And may the angels of thy light dwelling within this house protect all in this house through the persecution of the devil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll be safe now. He told us, after everything's been blessed, you say your prayers, and everything will be fun. Lord, we beg you to visit the house and to banish from it all the deadly powers of the enemy. May your holy angels dwell here to keep us in peace, and may your blessings be upon us always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. That night, when the family goes to bed, they hope their prayers will be answered. I woke up from a horrible dream, a horrific dream enough to make you wake up in sweats. But this is no dream. Directly on the other side of the bed, there is this thing. He was three feet from me looking straight in the face at me. Boy, what a way to wake up. Holy mother of God! I grab the crucifix, grab the holy water, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Jesus Christ! No. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Get out of my house. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I threw holy water all over my house. And I'm standing in circles with the crucifix going like this. Yeah, though I shall walk in the shadow of the valley of death. I oh, fear Kathy, no evil, for thou art with me. Kathy. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Kathy. Surely goodness and mercy will be with me all the days of my life. Mom was throwing it like, holy water, holy water, throwing it all over the room. Kathy, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I felt the presence of something there. I couldn't see or hear it. There was definitely something going on, and it was unexplainable on a human level. <laughs> That's not my mom. That's not the real mom that she always was. I waited up all night. I did not close my eyes. And as soon as that sun came up, I got on the phone with that priest. Hi, Father. It's Kathy. Father, it's, it's still here. I woke up this morning and I could hear it chanting. Then I saw it right next to me, face to face. I told him what happened. He said, get out of the house immediately. The concern that he had was a possession. So did I. It felt great leaving the house. It got to a point where none of us really wanted to be in the house. Michael said, Mommy, you're scaring me. You're scaring me. And I said, shut your mouth. Don't say a word in the car. Don't talk. Don't anybody talk. Don't tell anybody where we're going. Say nothing. Get in the car. Nobody said a word. After Kathy and her family spend the night in a hotel, Kathy determines there is only one last way to rid the demon from her home. She must do it herself. It was hard to go back into the house. Out of the three of us, I think I was probably the least scared. Um, but it was still, I was still a little on edge, you know, about, you know, falling asleep at night, not knowing what's gonna be over me if I wake up or you know, what's gonna happen. What am I? <laughs> Joan of Arc? No. I'm just Kathy. I am not a priest. I'm not a nun. I don't know how to do an exorcism. I don't fight demons. I'm just a regular girl that works. I had to keep myself calm. I had to feel love. No fighting. I gotta pray, I gotta focus, and I gotta close this thing. The time has come for Kathy to become a heroine or a victim as she battles the dark force trying to destroy her in the ultimate battle between good and evil. For Kathy Sheets, control of her home and her soul has come down to one final battle. I felt so alone and so scared, but I couldn't give up. The only way to close a portal is with your emotions. You have to be strong. You have to feel the full power of the Lord to get it out. They want you mad, they want you upset, they want you crying, they want you to be fearful. You do the opposite. Have no fear. No fear. We now claim that the strong man shall be bound through the precious blood and in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. It was my last flare left in a sinking ship. Help. It was all I got. I'm at the end of my rope. I command you to leave this house. This is the house of God. Oh, I was yelling in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to leave my home. I command you. This is a house of God. Nothing else. Of God. And there's nothing more powerful than God. That's good. Keep praying. I'll keep praying. You're doing good. You're doing good. Come on. Give us this day our daily bread. Get out of my home. This is my home. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You put your hand up in mercy, and you're calling upon the strongest angel in heaven. He's a warrior. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. 
be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we most humbly pray. Do thou, O Prince of the Most Heavenly Host, by the power of God, send into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander this world, seeking the ruin of souls. God, help me. Saint Michael, help me. He grabs your arm. You can feel the fingers. But not too strong enough to hurt me. But strong enough to let me know I'm there. But the good news is, is that my side came in. Because my prayers did work. And those floodlights went on. And you can hear, save her. Somebody help her. Somebody help this woman on this realm. I thank God every single day for that second visit. God, thank you, you saved my life. Kathy believes that she was literally touched by an angel. She feels confident that the worst is over. After this had happened, uh, I saw a drastic change. It was almost a night and day difference. When I saw this happen to mom, I felt like it was a very small miracle. A lot of stuff has been gone and the cast is way out of the house. A lot of people are victims of fear and they don't do anything. They don't know how to fight it. Kathy's learning how to be a fighter. She's not allowing certain situations in the material world or other worlds to intimidate her anymore. That was what the whole lesson was about. That's the truth, not to be afraid. I don't see the dark spirits. I don't feel them there. It is as if the, the weight of the house is off. It's, it's, like a, um, it's like being smothered, and now you're not. You can breathe. You can breathe. You can rest. You can sleep. I think I'll always sleep with my rosary and my crucifix in my Bible, in my holy water. I carry them with me everywhere I go. That will take a long time put those down, but I should be praying anyway. But I feel confident now, knowing that they're there for me. I'm never alone. After this happened, I know I'm never alone. I'll never be alone, ever again. Ozark River Valley once stood as the gateway to the west, the last outpost of civilization before the frontier beyond. But nestled amid this lush countryside lies a different kind of portal, a crossroads between life and death, where the mortal and the eternal collide.
In October 2003, Jamie and Ben Shea's search for a larger home leads them to Markham, Arkansas, an hour outside Little Rock. It's got some character to it, doesn't it? It's beautiful. Well, it's so historic. It was just absolutely beautiful. It had big, old, old trees all around it. And it was just the picture of the house I've been looking for all my life. Built in the late 1700s, the home is one of the oldest in the state. I'm kind of a history buff, so that definitely piqued my interest. Ben can already picture raising his three children there. I knew that my kids could run out there and you know, just have a good time. I grew up that way, M me running out and playing in the woods, and I definitely wanted that for my kids. Did the agent give you a key? The house is a short commute to Arbutus, where Jamie is a legal assistant. Ben is earning his degree while working nights as a nurse at a local factory. It was in between the two towns where my husband worked and where my husband went to school, so he could spend more time with the kids and not have to be traveling back and forth as much. Not so bad. I thought the walls would be peeling or something. I know. It looks like everything's in pretty good shape. There was a lot of room. I could totally see how the kids would have plenty of room to play. I knew as soon as I saw it that we had to have that house. We need to make an offer on the place before anybody else sees it. Okay, maybe we should look at the rest of the house first. Okay. Wow, this is great. The ceilings don't have any water spots. The roof must be in great shape. It's almost too good to be true. <laughs> I'll say. Oh my God, what is this? Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. The fireplace had all kinds of markings on it, like the name of this boy that had died, pentagrams. It takes a lot to kind of spook me, so I was just like, oh, some teenager, you know, lived here before. And I the Shays remain it. enthusiastic about the house. Looks like a nice fireplace, shouldn't be boarded up anyway. You think it still works? We decided right away the first thing that we would do was get rid of that. But other than that, it was just perfect. Within a few weeks, the family is all settled in. Wow, it's beautiful. D did you pick up those colors, Bridger? Yes. The couple's three children Eight-month-old Jackson, five-year-old Bridger, and 11-year-old Tori are delighted by their new surroundings. Oh, that's Taylor calling for me. Again? Did you get this many phone calls when you were her age? I am just glad that she's adjusting to her new school well. Give me one more. <laughs> the Shays quickly fall into a busy routine. You guys need to hurry up, because it's time to get to the bus, OK? Jamie hires an experienced sitter to watch the baby during the day. Hi. Hey. Uh, ben, this is Molly. Molly's going to be here with Jackson until I get home, OK? Sounds terrific. Ben works all night, so he'll be asleep. Till about 2, and then I'm off to class. Bye. Mm. Get some sleep, OK? OK, um, call me if you need anything. Everything's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Bye, Jackson. Can you please get the baby? Molly? 
I know for a fact. I wasn't dreaming. There was a baby crying out on the monitor, and there was nobody home. It was a very creepy moment. Unsure what to make of it, Ben keeps the strange incident to himself. A few nights later, Ben trudges off to work, reminding himself that graduation is only a few months away. doing up? I'm scared. People are talking in my room. Well, who's talking? Tori? No, it's not Tori. It was just a bad dream, Bridget. Now go to sleep. My first thought was, did I leave the television on in the living room? I did a little quick listen, and it was completely silent. Later that night, around 3 a.m. Scaring her brother, Tori does not tell him that she has also heard strange sounds. No, I, I it was probably just a bad dream. You're just adjusting to your new bedroom. That's all. None of the shades mention their individual experiences. For the next few weeks, Time passes uneventfully. Despite the demands of his hectic schedule, Ben spends time with Bridger before leaving for work. Hey, 
and the old gray octopus swam back into his dark watery cave at the bottom of the sea and never, ever came back out again. The end. We did it again. Oh, it's getting late, kiddo. Give me a kiss. I love you. I love you too. Get in bed. Close ben eyes. hopes that after he earns his degree, he can work normal hours and spend more time with his family. Mommy! Are you saying goodnight to Daddy before he leaves? I gotta go to work, buddy. I wish you didn't have to go. Me too. Love you. Love you too. Bye. Good night. kids in bed for the night. Jamie takes advantage of the quiet. Tori, is that you? Bridger, Tori, get back to bed. I kept hearing my kids running up and down the stairs. Get back in bed! The door was wide open. It didn't slam. I thought it was pretty creepy. All three of the kids were sleeping and I was the only one in the house besides the kids. weekend. The eerie occurrences nag at Jamie until she can ignore them no longer. Molly told me the weirdest story today. She said that she heard crying in the baby monitor and when she went upstairs to check on Jackson, he was asleep. She said it looked like he hadn't even been crying. The other day I heard crying on that thing. Jackson wasn't even home. Somebody's up. Well, it sounds like it's from down here. It's gotta be Bridger. I'll take care of this. It sounded like a, like a, a ball bouncing. I went to check on the kids and yell at them for being up so late and messing around. And, and you know, of course, everybody's sleeping. Well? They're all asleep. You know, these, these old houses, they make all kinds of noises that you can't explain. It's getting late. I'm going to bed. You coming? I'll be there in a second. All the strange occurrences suddenly make sense. At that moment, 
I did start to get the feeling that we were living in a haunted house. Jamie visits the local library, hoping to learn more about ghosts and hauntings. I'll finish this up for you. Okay. Brenda will finish helping you. I can't help noticing what kind of books you're checking out here. Are you interested in learning about ghosts? Yes. I grew up in a house that was haunted. Was it around here? 721 Franklin. Jamie is astonished. It's the house where her family now lives. By the ghost of a boy. She started telling me about a boy that had fallen out of the window and died. And he had fallen out of the room that was Bridger's room, where he had been hearing the voices and the, the people talking. I felt the color just rush out of my face. Everything makes sense now. All the little things that had happened that I thought, you know, someone was starting to play with us. Did you ever feel afraid? I mean, did this ghost ever hurt anyone? I just think he was looking for attention, you know? Poor little guy. You let me know if these help you. The next morning, Jamie eagerly awaits Ben's return home from work so she can tell him what she learned. She worries about how living in a haunted house may affect her children. No, you have to wait till it's cooked. It only takes eight minutes. Hey guys, what you doing? Daddy! Daddy! Buddy? Hello? I'm making cookies. Ooh, I see you're putting your Saturday morning to good use, huh? Bridger, your hands are sticky. Why don't you go wash them up? Can you help them out? Bridger, don't touch anything. Ben, I talked to somebody who's lived in this house before. What's your man is that? She works at the library. I met her there. She says that there was a ghost in this house. A little boy. A little boy? I don't know what I feel about living in a haunted house. It was a scary feeling to know that we weren't the only ones there. Well, did she say that the ghost ever hurt anyone? Yeah, she said it never touched anyone. Ben assures Jamie that the little boy's ghost will not harm their family. <sighs> then we'll be fine. I didn't feel like it would really threaten her. You know, I just kind of thought maybe this haunting stuff will kind of die down. As the holiday season arrives, the activity quiets down around the house. Someone was standing right behind me. So we're gonna stop. I'll put in the paperwork. Let me uh, grab that. First aid. Ben, thank God you answered. Jamie, what's wrong? I felt like I was being watched, and then suddenly I looked up and I saw him on my computer screen. You, you saw who? Ben, I didn't get a good look at who it was. Right, but... What happened? It was evil. I'll try to come home early, I promise. It was very frustrating. And, and not being able to be there, I felt totally trapped. That was probably the first time that I felt threatened. I didn't feel like it was a little boy playing games with us. I knew that this was something different.
Jamie wonders if the woman who saw the boy's ghost ever encountered the other spirit. Is, is Brenda working? I'm sorry, Brenda no longer works here. Do you know how I can get in touch with her? I'm afraid not. She left with no forwarding address or telephone number. Did she leave the area? I think so, but I can't give you any more information Look, than that. Look, I am just a friend trying to get in touch with her. Is there something I can help you with? No. Thank you. I was really disappointed because I thought this is going to be at least an answer to what we're dealing with here. Although days pass without incident, the dark presence continues to weigh on Jamie's mind. Aren't you forgetting something? Oh, my briefcase. Hey, uh, don't forget to pick up Tori after school. She's over at Megan's. I forgot. I really had a real just eerie kind of sick feeling in my stomach. I really dreaded going home. It was starting to not feel like a home anymore. You enjoying working on that group project you and Megan are working on? Yeah, I, I'm finishing it now. Be great if you didn't hit all the bumps. Sorry, honey, there's road construction. Thought we'd have some pause tonight. How does that sound? When I got out, Tori was under the minivan, pinned face down with a, the weight of, a, of the entire minivan on her, and I thought, she's not going to make it through this. <laughs> She... I think her back would be broken. Oh my God. They didn't know exactly to what extent she had a broken back. And so we were obviously concerned about whether she could ever walk again. It terrified me to not know. Okay. You believe Tori may have compression fractures to several of her vertebrae? I thought back about the events of the day and feeling like I was being watched and that whole feeling that I had before we had the wreck. I started to wonder if there was some kind of connection. Right now, I just have to wait. Thank you. Two weeks after the accident, the hospital releases Tori, just in time for Christmas. Although her doctor expects her to make a full recovery, Tori will be bedridden for several months. What are you doing here? Get I like this. She could not walk without help, so I took a leave of absence from work because she needed pretty much constant care. You sure? Are you okay? Bridger, that's Tori's scooter. It's okay. He can ride it. It was an awful Christmas because we had just bought her a scooter. Don't worry, you'll be up and around riding on that thing before you know it. The scooter is kind of like a... Like, hey, you know, you will, you will walk again. You will be able to ride the scooter eventually. You're not paralyzed. Thank the good Lord for that. Come on, Tori. You heard what the doctor said. You are young and strong. You are going to be up and about in no time. Weeks pass. Jamie is so focused on Tori that she barely notices any paranormal activity. I really didn't think of anything else other than I wanted my daughter to be okay. Bridger, what are you doing up? 
people in my room are talking again. What are they saying? I can't understand them. The good boys and the bad boys all talk over each other. What bad boys? Who are the bad boys? I don't know. Can I sit with you and Dad? Okay, you can stay with us tonight. He's sleeping with us tonight. He's hearing voices again. I'm gonna go check on Jackson. Hey, buddy. Uh, you okay? Did you hear something scary? Jamie's relieved to find Jackson sleeping peacefully, unaffected by the voices that plague Bridger. feel safe anymore. I don't think I can handle it. I feel like we are being watched all the time. But there's no way we can go anywhere until Tori is better. I didn't care whether the house was haunted or not at that point. We were just going to take care of our daughter, get her walking again. Well, we can start looking now, and I'll put the house on the market and see what kind of offers we get. In all our free time. Yeah, really. I loved this house. Yeah. Me too. talking about? I didn't touch your hair. <laughs> Seriously, I didn't touch you. urgent need to get everybody into the same room and that way I could protect them in some way. Little man, we are just gonna sleep right here. Somebody please just tell me what's going on. Just a little excitement, that's all. We've gotta find somebody who can help us. We cannot live like this. There was an evil presence in the house that was out to harm us and it wasn't the boy. It was something else. It was starting to show itself more. And I knew we had to do something. The Shays contact the Central Arkansas Society for Paranormal Research. They arrange to come to the house as soon as Tori is well enough to be moved. This is ridiculous. I don't understand why I have to go. I need you to go with the boys and help Molly out. It's only for one night she's gonna bring you back in the morning, okay?
Thanks, Molly. We really appreciate you doing it such last okay. minute. Why don't you take the kids out to get some pizza tonight, okay? okay. I'll call. The team of investigators arrives and sets up for the night. Alan Lowe's goal is to find physical proof to explain the paranormal occurrences. His wife, Angela, and their daughter, Violet, are psychics. The women in my family have always been very psychic, sensitive, open to the spirit world. Violet's gift goes beyond sensing. I'm probably classified better as a medium. I can talk to them and they can talk to me and there can be sort of a two-way conversation. The house makes an immediate impression on them. And when we walked in the house, it had sort of a depressing vibe. You know, it just felt heavy. I've done some research on the house and it verifies what you've heard. Karen Schillings tries to connect the supernatural events to the house's history. Built in 1780, it once served as a hotel and stagecoach stop, and later as a county jail. Why would that cause the house to be haunted? Oh. Alan That's explains so. that the house's rich past and could account for the presence of spirits. The because it served as a way station of sorts. We'll walk through the house and see if we can sense any hot spots of spirit activity. When I got to the top of the stairs, it was a sinking feeling. And it was definitely coming from that direction of the house towards that room. Alan sets up a video camera where the psychics feel negative energy. senses a presence. She thinks it wants to make contact, but is too frightened to approach her. I felt like somebody walked in the room. Don't be afraid. I mean, he was human, but he didn't look like he was really standing there. He was sort of see-through. Will you talk to us? <laughs> There's something else. Someone else is here. We felt like he'd been scared away by a very strong negative presence in the house. <sighs> it was like a whole sea of people. They weren't happy, they seemed pretty miserable. It felt like they didn't want you there. Like you shouldn't be in this room. It didn't look human. This presence was something different and it was really terrifying. And I haven't been afraid of a house or a ghost since I was a young child, but this one scared me. The 
psychics tell Jamie and Ben about the little boy and the multitude of human spirits they encountered. Those are the voices your son has been hearing. And inform them there is a negative presence in the house. We don't know what it is, but with your permission... Angela hopes to communicate with it in order to learn more. One of the paranormal team people suggested that we find out more details about the spirits by asking them questions through the Ouija board. And I really didn't believe in the whole Ouija board thing. Skeptical because a Ouija board can be easily manipulated, Ben handles the planchette. Me and one of the paranormal team guys did the Ouija board while other people were asking questions. What is your name? the dark spirit and learn it calls itself Seth. When were you alive? physical person who had died. This was a demon who had never lived. But to know that you've actually been in the same house with some sort of demonic presence and knowing that it could do harm, it definitely uh, it scares you. The planchette's erratic movement indicates Seth is extremely powerful. Have we seen you? Pointing to the camera. When I saw the figure on the video screen, I knew right away that it was the same figure that was looking down on us the day that we had the car accident. And I got that same sick feeling in my stomach. Can you think of any fortune-telling, conjuring, devil-worshipping that might have summoned a demon? Not us, but, but when we first moved in here, we found pentagrams and candles in the bedroom. We thought it was just a bunch of kids messing around. They might have opened a door they shouldn't have. A door? A portal to the other side. Show yourself to us. Unleash your powers. Whether it was those kids or someone else, evil had been invited into that house. Angela fears for the family's safety. The spirit was so negative and so evil and so aggressive that the possibility of the family being in danger was very real if something wasn't done. I recommend she cleansing. recommends a ritual cleansing to clear the house of the evil spirit. <laughs> The planchette just started going crazy, almost like in a figure eight, just around in circles as fast as it could go. It was really, really scary. Seth wields the planchette, expressing his rage at the decision to perform a cleansing. We knew that Seth was totally against this and was trying to stop us from doing it. He definitely didn't want us there and he didn't want us doing the cleansing. Using a Native American tradition, they burn sage to bless the house. The sage is used to cleanse areas of negativity so that you can see clearly into the spirit world. 
And in our prayers, while we're doing the cleansing, we ask the Heavenly Father to protect this family and fill the home with white light and rid it of any negativity. Let no evil come in. Let no evil torment this family. Protect this household. Let no evil come in. Let no evil torment this family. Protect Jackson. Protect Bridger. Protect Tori. Protect Ben. Protect Jamie. Protect this family. Protect this household. Let no evil come in. There was heaviness against our chest like we were being pushed back. He was trying to literally push us out of the house. Angela and Violet continue their struggle to rid the Shea House of an evil entity that calls itself Seth. It was pretty clear to me that it was resisting so strongly. The air was getting thicker and thicker, and it felt like something might grab you at any moment. Protect this family! Protect this household! a circle of salt that will guard the house from Seth's return. Will you draw a line around the house to protect it from evil? When we finished the cleansing, the entire atmosphere had changed. Although the house has been cleansed, the human spirits will remain. I immediately felt a sense of peace in the air. I felt that the sense of evil had been lifted. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the next several months, life for the Shea family returns to normal. Sure. All right, two it is. Here we go. Well, hello, Sleeping Beauty. Fortunately, Tori makes a full recovery. You want some pancakes? Yes, please. Can I have mine with grape jelly? You sure can. Nothing but the best for you, sweetie? Who breaks their back in three places without being paralyzed? Here we are. She's, a, she's definitely a miracle. So we're very, very grateful for that. the weekend. Uh, look, I'm glad you're back at work, but can't just wait till Monday. No, I have a meeting first thing. Look, I'll, I'll take the kids to the fair tomorrow. You can have the whole house to yourself. I've been studying finals all week and I haven't seen you. I guess I could take a break. Bridger, are you okay? Bridger, talk to us. It wasn't Bridger. It sounded kind of wicked, and it just cut right through me. Bridger! Uh, Dad, what am I doing down here? Bridger, you stay here with your daddy. I'll be right back. You okay, buddy? Make out two voices. It just kept getting louder and louder and louder. I was just gonna look at you. When I saw that thing at the end of the hallway, the first thing I thought was, oh no, 
we're not starting this again. We're getting out of here! Although the cleansing force is Seth out, the house remains a portal to the other side. You okay, little man? I'm fine, Dad. You sure? Where are you going? Go, 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 go. Using that doorway, a new demonic presence has emerged to take Seth's place. It was still haunted, and it was going to stay haunted, no matter what we did. The Shays know that if they stay in the house, dark entities will continue to prey on them. Ben and Jamie immediately put the house on the market and moved to an apartment nearby. A few weeks later, Ben finishes school and the family starts a new life in a new town. We are a much tighter family outside of that home. We're not dealing with the constant stress of being haunted. You taught him well. I always thought when I was younger that it would be kind of cool to live in a haunted house. I would never want to experience that again. Soon, another family moves into the house. They hear the ghost boy playing. But have yet to encounter the demon that plagued the chaise.